So Brittany uh, Sinavi is going to talk uh, about uh, pediatric melanoma. Um, so uh, Brittany, it's up to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, pediatric melanoma and how it differs from adult melanoma. Um, for background, I am um, I am a pediatric oncologist, and so I take care of children with all forms of cancer, but specialize in um, in patients, young patients with uh, melanoma and skin cancer. So the first question I always get um, that I'm always asked is, do children get melanoma? And the answer is, of course, yes, because I'm here speaking um, to you about it today. But um, I think reviewing some of the statistics about pediatric melanoma will help understand why many people don't know that this is something that children um, that children can get. And so um, for new cases of melanoma estimated in the year of 2021, there will be about 100 and. 6,000 um, cases. The percent of new melanoma cases by different age groups, so in zero to 20 years of age, that'll make up less than 1% of all cases of melanoma, accounting for about 420 cases. When we move into the older age bracket of 20 to 34 years of age, um, that'll make up about 5% of cases, um, accounting for about 5,000 cases. And just, um, I should take a step back and define this AYA term. So in pediatric um, oncology, we often take care of adolescents and, and up into the young adult age group. And the age bracket of 15 to 39 years of age is often termed the adolescent and young adult age group. So I'll be referring to that age bracket a lot um, with my pediatric cohort. So to compare these numbers um, for new cases of all types of cancer that we see in children, zero to 14 years of age, we'll see about 10,500 cases. So you can see a lot fewer cases of all cases of pediatric cancer compared to all cases of melanoma alone. Um, and then when we move into the older age bracket of 15 to 39 years of age, those AYAs, there'll be about 88,000 new cases of cancer um, each year um, in 2021. So I always say it's a drop in the bucket. And for that reason, um, it's been overlooked for some time in the pediatric, um, um, in terms of pediatric melanoma and where it stands in the, in the melanoma world as a whole. Um, but despite this, it is the most common type of skin cancer in children that, that we see. So um, one of the things that I'm, that as a pediatrician, I was, taught early and is one of the mantras of pediatrics is that children are not little adults. And so although they, um, although children may get melanoma um, as adults do as well, we know that we can't just assume that everything can be done to them that we do to adults. Diseases may manifest differently as I'm talking about here today. Their bodies and their minds are developing and growing. Um, and so we have to take that in consideration with all therapies and treatments that we prescribe for them. Their bodies work differently. There's different physiology. They're dependent on others for, um, for their care. They need someone to recognize something is abnormal on them to bring them to, to see us um, and to even um, perform any activity that they need to live um, every day in their life. And then importantly, they tolerate medications and treatments differently. Sometimes that means they may tolerate them better. And sometimes that might mean that they tolerate them worse. And um, really importantly, they have a much longer life expectancy. So um, this it, it's becoming increasingly more prevalent in the literature to see um, pediatric melanoma being discussed. And for, and for that reason, I'm so glad. So first of all, how are they similar? pediatric and adult melanoma? Well, a biopsy is always needed for diagnosis. The staging system is the same. Most patients will have localized disease at diagnosis. The prognosis is completely dependent on, on stage. 90% are expected to be alive at five years after diagnosis. And then the treatment guidelines, for the most part, are the same. And I'll get to that a little bit more later. For the risk factors, those are also the same in a lot of cases. So fair skin, light colored eyes, red or blonde hair, um, those that have poor tanning ability, excessive exposure to UV sunlight, 
increased numbers of common or benign moles, history of dysplastic nevi, and then a family history of melanoma, all very important in the risk factors for pediatric melanoma. And now for the differences. And here I feature a photo of one of my, um, one of my fellow oncologists at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and one of his, um, one of our cancer patients who adores him and dressed up like him at Halloween. And you can see despite it, to the best of his effort um, to look exactly like him, um, he's still different just like pediatric melanoma is different from adults. So first terminology and classification is the most challenging. Um, this is the most challenging when I see a new patient. Um, if, a, if a child has had a biopsy and the diagnosis comes back melanoma, in some ways that makes it a little bit easier to come up with a treatment plan. But in a lot of cases, given their age, the diagnosis of melanoma won't be given. And there'll be a lot of other terms on the pathology report. A typical melanocytic tumor, a typical melanocytic tumor of uncertain malignant potential, a typical melanocytic proliferation, and so on and so forth. Um, and a lot of times we have to use this descriptive terminology and all of the information in front of us, including the presentation of the lesion itself and um, how the child is doing overall to make a decision about, about their treatment moving forward. Um, also, how we classify melanoma, if even when we get a diagnosis of straightforward melanoma, um, is a little bit different in the pediatric world. So we'll often refer to three different types of melanoma, one being conventional or, quote, adult type melanoma, the second being spitz melanoma, which I'll elaborate on in the next slide, and then the third being melanoma arising within a congenital melanocytic nevus. So a little bit about um, Spitz melanoma. Dr. Sophie Spitz was an American pathologist who discovered in 1948 what she termed juvenile melanoma um, or children that were having biopsies of skin lesions um, for which underneath a microscope appeared a lot like melanoma, but overall seemed to be having better outcomes than, than most adults do with melanoma. And from this, we've used her name and linked it to melanoma in pediatric melanoma moving forward. There are benign moles that are called spitz nevus um, for which I often don't see the patients but our dermatology colleagues do. Um, and then there are a very puzzling group of tumors called a typical spitz tumor in which we have to work to um, decide whether or not it is melanoma or an atypical mole. And then um, last spitz melanoma. And so this, um, we really get into the challenges of a rare disease. Here we are, uh, most people don't even know pediatric melanoma exists. Um, and so when a child presents to a doctor with a new skin lesion, there's often de delays in diagnosis associated with a low index of suspicion, an atypical presentation, which I'll also discuss. Um, and then a difficulty identifying that atypical nevus or, or abnormal mole um, from a true melanoma. And so just a little bit more about um, the low index of suspicion and the atypical presentation in children. So most people will be familiar with this. Um, it is as the clinical um, acronym that we use to detect an abnormal mole that may signify melanoma or the ABCDEs of melanoma. So and these apply to children too, but as, as I'll talk about next, um, this isn't how we always detect an abnormal skin lesion in a child. So A is for asymmetry, B for uneven borders, C for color variation, D for diameter greater than six millimeters, and then E for evolving, meaning any mole that's changing, bleeding, itching, crusting, or in other words, is the ugly duckling. Interestingly, in pediatric melanoma, um, those same ABCDEs don't always help us to identify a lesion on a child that needs to have a biopsy. So um, there was a study of 70 patients, zero to 19 years of age from the 80s to 2009. And in 60% of the patients in the zero to 10 um, year old age group and 40% of the patients in the 11 to 19 year age group they did not prevent, present with these conventional ABCDE criteria. So how do they present? Well, often they present um, 
with a smooth red bump on their skin. Um, and this other ABCD criteria was developed by those researchers um, to help um, pediatric providers know when to suspect an abnormal lesion on a child. So the A here stands for amelanosis, meaning that it's you, you cannot see the brown or black pigmentation. B is for bleeding or a bump. C is for uniform color as, it, as opposed to um, varied color. And then D is for variable diameter, meaning the size really doesn't matter. Even a small red bump um, on a child could, could be the first presentation of a melanoma. And um, oftentimes um, these are de novo, meaning they did not have a pre-existing mole. They never had a, um, a lesion there and it kind of popped out of nowhere, which is the story that most, uh, most parents will tell me about their child's melanoma. So the diagnosis, um, reaching that diagnosis is different in pediatrics um, and accurate diagnosis, especially in the spitz category that I had discussed earlier is incredibly challenging. The morphological assessment, meaning what it looks like under the microscope alone has limited, um, has limitations. And we know that um, there's often expert disagreement. If the same, um, if similar experts both look at the same lesion, they might arrive at a different um, diagnosis, which is a real problem for, um, for us um, trying to develop a treatment plan for the patient. And then importantly, integrating genomic analysis. So what are the genetic changes of the melanoma or the tumor itself? in the evaluation of a pediatric melanocytic tumor can optimize the diagnostic accuracy and provide important prognostic information for the treating physician, such as myself. But I talk about this with all families. There's not one molecular marker in a tumor. There's yet to be that holy grail that will identify which, um, which child with pediatric melanoma will have a poor outcome and which children with pediatric melanoma will do just fine to, um, regardless of our treatment strategies. Um, and then interestingly, children and adolescent, adolescents often present with thicker primary tum um, tumors than do adults. So they have more advanced T-stage by classification and they'll more frequently have um, disease spread to their lymph nodes at the time of sentinel lymph node biopsy. But despite this, their primary despite these thicker primary tumors and the high rate of node positivity, the outcomes appear to be better for younger patients. And why is the, is the million dollar question? We still do not know this. Treatment, so as I discussed before, most treatment is per adult guidelines. Um, the wide excision that needs to be performed on a primary melanoma is um, we follow the same adult guidelines in terms of the size of that excision. Though there are unique considerations based on the child's size and their future for growth and development. As you can imagine, doing a large surgery on a two-year-old um, is quite challenging as their overall body is so much smaller compared to an adult. Um, there is a debate whether or not sentinel lymph node biopsy is as useful in the spitzoid category of lesions, um, which is often, um, is often a detailed discussion with the family before proceeding with that, um, with that next step. Completion lymph node dissection, um, the utility of that has never been studied in pediatric melanoma. We do follow the same adult guidelines, though I do note a much, much lower rate of complications um, from completion lymph node dissections in children compared to adults. And then systemic therapy for children, there's been no efficacy trials studied on pediatric patients for melanoma specifically. Um, and oftentimes we do follow the robust adult data and use dosing guidelines um, based off of um, the adult guidelines and reports of how children have tolerated those drugs in other, um, in other pediatric cancers. And with that, I'll leave you with our melanoma program. Um, we are available um, through the Hillman and the um, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh website. Lauren, who you heard from earlier today, takes in all referrals. And we're really happy to see um, any child with a melanocytic tumor, whether or not it's melanoma or it might be melanoma, um, or there's any worry for that um, to help sort through this difficult diagnosis and come up with the best treatment plan. And again, it takes a, it takes a village to take care of these patients. 
um, really thank all of the support from patients and families like yourself um, in providing in providing care for these patients. In the future, the future is bright with research and collaboration. Um, and I really hope that um, in speaking to you all and speaking to other groups of, of providers and individuals that we can improve the recognition, diagnosis, prognostication, disease understanding, and treatment options for children with melanoma um, to ultimately improve um, their outcomes. And with that, I'll thank you. And take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh... Brittany for this uh, great presentation. It's always a very uh, stressful thing, right? To, to have to face a pediatric melanoma, um, very difficult diagnosis very often, right? That's where maybe uh, teamwork is very important, bringing together the oncologist, the pathologist and so on.